Good morning and welcome to Worship for Sunday, April 19th, 2020. We are so pleased to have you here with us today. Unfortunately, we still cannot gather in person. I'm hoping that you're watching me on public access TV or on YouTube or on Facebook. Whatever the case is, we welcome you here today. So, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I welcome you to worship this morning. One of my absolute favorite Easter hymns is found on page 218 in your hymnal, or else you're welcome to follow along with us in the bulletin. That song would happen to be Thine is the Glory. I will sing verse 1 and verse 1 only. I encourage you to, after the service is over, look back into your hymnal or into your bulletin and perhaps sing the song in its entirety. Thine is the glory, risen, conquering Son. Endless is the victory, though our death has won. Angels in bright remnant roll the stone Welcome all who are gathered here today. It is a privilege to have you joining us. Remember, here at St. Paul's, all are always welcome in this place. Let us build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. A place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive. Built of hopes and dreams and visions, rocks of faith and vaults of grace. Here the love of Christ shall end division. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. And with that, I invite you to share with me in our call to worship, which again you will find printed within your bulletin. We have seen and we have heard. Christ is risen. The cross and the tomb are empty. Christ is risen. The disciples saw his hands. Christ is risen. They saw his side. Christ has risen. Love has come to life. We come to worship the risen Christ, who is risen indeed. Please be with me then for a moment of opening prayer. To God, we need you in our lives. We need your help to open our hearts and our minds to trust you with our lives and with all that we hold dear. We hold out our hands to you and open them, releasing our fears, our hopes, and dreams into the great mercy and love. We hold out our hands to you to be grasped by you and held within your loving arms. We hold out our hands to you to be led by you in ways of life and in peace. Amen. Speaking of peace, I invite you to pass the peace with whoever you may have joining you in the room with you today. Of course, we are no longer shaking hands, so a simple bow of acknowledgement would simply do. Jesus said, peace be with you. 
As God has sent me, so I send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. May the peace of the Lord be with you and also with you. I bow to you to this day as a gesture of peace and welcome. Well, one of my favorite times in the worship service is when we gather with the kids and lots of times here at St. Paul's there's so many kids that are gathered I'm actually afraid I'm going to step on their fingers someday but we've not seen you guys for a long time so I hope that you're all doing well. Viv and Marco and Jack and Alaska and Matt just to name a few. It's so nice to have you joining with, with us today. I'm hoping you're watching along. But I do want to have a children's moment with you today, even though you're not here with me. I have with me today a lock and a chain. Now, if you want to lock up something, truly this is a pretty heavy chain, you can see that. And that would do it. Of course, I have a padlock here. And we all know that a padlock is used for locking the chain or locking the door. So um, if you want to lock up your bike, or if you want to lock up your toys in the backyard, or lock up whatever it may be you want to lock up, you simply need to take a key, and I have a key here, and a padlock, and do just simply that. Lock it. All right, I can see this is locked pretty tight. It won't open. Well, I have my car keys here with me. And, you know, car keys are different these days. It used to be you needed to have an actual key to open things. Well, now we have actually key fobs. I have one for the door of the church. I have one here for the car as well. So I don't really have a key to open my car anymore. And I know, um, even sitting here in the sanctuary, my car is parked just outside. If I would hit the unlock button, that my car would unlock. But I don't want to do that. We want to be safe and leave it locked up in the parking lot. But, and, and you notice, I have tons of keys. So I kind of have to look through the keys and see which is the right one. Let's see if this one is. Well, by golly, it was. And it opened up the chain, opened up the padlock. See? Well, this padlock happens to be one we use outside in our garage. And after this is over here, I'm going to take this and put it back outside and, and lock up what I need to lock up. But sometimes we simply need to keep things locked to keep them safe. Well, my story today that I'm going to be sharing here in just about a minute or two is about the disciples. And they were in a room and they locked the door too, thinking that they would be safe. But Jesus was able to get into that room anyhow. So I'm going to share that story with your moms and dads and all of you in a minute. But in the meantime, I do encourage you to, to lock your doors of your house and lock perhaps the car and take the keys. Maybe lock up your bicycle. You certainly don't want it stolen because that is a way to keep things safe. But again, in our story today, Jesus comes right through those locked doors. You know what? Sometimes our heart is a little bit like that too. We lock somebody out. We won't let them in. We decide that we don't want to love them anymore. But just like Jesus came through that locked door and that locked house, Jesus wants to come into your heart also. So I pray this day that no matter what's going on in your life, you open the door to your heart to Jesus. Okay? Well, be with me for just a moment of prayer, please. Almighty and wondrous God, we simply pray this day that you come into our lives, that you open the doors to our hearts, no matter how close they may be to new people and new things, no matter how much we maybe want to be mad at somebody, may we open our hearts and let them in today. Amen. Well, I'm going to take my chain, and I'm going to set it right down here. After I get my key out of the, do out of the block. And I'll set it right here on the floor. And so remember, kids, to open the door to your heart. Uh, with that, then, today, I'd like to share with you our Old Testament lesson 
for everyone here. The Old Testament lesson is so familiar, I'm pretty sure that you will know it by heart. But today, we're doing a little bit something different with verse 4. So I invite you to listen very carefully. It is the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his namesake. In this dark place, I will not fear, for this is the place of starlight and moonshine and silvery clouds where gale galaxies radiate and blaze as they sprint across the expanse of sky where night birds see crickets sing and robins graze on dewy grass where candles glow and stories are told where dreams are dreamt and secrets are exchanged in whispers so not as to disturb what should lay settled and dormant in this dark place i will not fear for here darkness is a gift that enables me to see so much more than the light. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This ends our Old Testament today, which is taken from Psalm 23. The gospel lesson for this morning is based off of and paraphrased from John 20, verses 19 through 31. On the first day of the week, Sunday, the disciples gathered in a locked room for fear of what would happen to them because of their known relationship with Jesus. This was the Sunday following the crucifixion, Easter Sunday. Suddenly, Jesus appeared among them and said, Peace be with you. Jesus could see the look of bewilderment on the faces as they said to one another, Do you see what I see? Jesus began to identify himself by showing them the crucifixion marks on his hands and on his side. Upon seeing the marks, the disciples rejoiced that Jesus was here with them. Isn't it just like Jesus to show up when all seems hopeless? When we think we are at the end, Jesus said again to the disciples, Peace be with you. He then reminded the disciples that it was through a relationship with God that he did his work. Just as Jesus was in the world to do God's work, they would be sent in the world to continue Jesus' work. Jesus then shared the spirit of peace with them, which would remain with them and give them power to continue sharing Jesus' love and life with others. One of the disciples, though, named Thomas, wasn't present for this meeting with Jesus. The other disciples told Thomas what they'd seen. Thomas was reluctant to believe. He had doubts, just like we do from time to time. He told his friends that unless he sees the nail marks and put his hand in Jesus' side, he will not believe. About a week later, the disciples found themselves in that same locked room. And this time, Thomas was with them. And Jesus appeared again and said, Peace be with you. He then directed the conversation right to Thomas. Thomas, see my hand. Put your finger here and, and place your hand into my side. Thomas, it is time to stop doubting and believe. Thomas replied, My Lord and my God. Jesus looked at him and said, You have believed because I am here. 
Blessed are those who believe, but have not yet seen. Jesus' miracles are written throughout the New Testament. So we may come to know Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, and have our life, too, with God. This ends our lesson today, which is again based on John 20, verses 19 through 31. I would invite you then to share with me, in a different song that's listed in our hymnal, one of my uh, favorite songs, I can remember singing this way back when I was a kid in, in choir class, was Let There Be Peace on Earth. If you happen to have a hymnal with you, you will find that song on page 677 of your hymnal. Join along with me. Again, I will sing the first verse. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. that was meant to be with God our creator children all are we let us walk with each other in perfect harmony let peace be peace I hope we can all share these days. With that, I'd like to share with you just a, some of my thoughts for this Sunday morning. I don't know, um, when you were a kid or maybe as a parent, there was a few phrases that would seriously strike fear into our hearts, especially as a parent. One of those were when one of the kids said, watch this. Yeah, well, that never led to anything good. Well, with the exception of broken arms and concussions and things that go along with a watch this moment. But then came the second phrase that as a parent, well, I kind of think we have the right to say, and that's, I told you so. How many times have you said to your kids, I told you so. When someone doesn't listen to us, when someone ignores our advice, and then gets them into trouble, of course, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty quick even now to say, I told you so. Man, I hate it. Don't just hate it. When you know that you are absolutely right, and someone still does something incredibly stupid anyway, hmm, I think the words... I told you so, especially after, watch this, are still seriously appropriate. Well, last Sunday, we were together and we celebrated Easter, the most important day of the Christian year. And I, and I think, seriously, the most joyful. We all love Christmas, that's true, but there's something about Easter. There is no news that can compare to the message that day. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Alleluia. I think that is something to get really excited about. So then, why aren't we more excited about it? Our Bible passage for this morning takes place on Easter Sunday. Actually, it's Easter Sunday night. 
Jesus' followers, so the disciples, are all locked away in a room. They're hiding from the Jewish leaders. They're, they're scared to death because they've seen what had happened to Jesus, and they all know now that that, that tomb that was empty. They, they really can't explain it. They really don't understand what just happened here. They do know the body is missing. Surely, they think, the authorities suspect that they snuck in some ways, means, or form and, and stole the body. And so imagine the disciples huddled together in this locked room discussing the possible disaster now that's awaiting them. And then suddenly, Jesus just simply shows up in that room and he stands amongst them. Well, what would you say if you were Jesus? If I was Jesus, I would say, I told you so. I told you that I would be arrested. I told you that I would be crucified. And I told you that I would raise again from the dead. The risen Christ greeted this terrified group of disciples with four little words. And they weren't, I told you so. It would have been me. They would have been, I told you so. But instead, Jesus says, peace be with you. Peace be with you. That is the last thing Jesus said directly to his disciples in John 16, 33. He had just explained that he was returning to his Father God. And the disciples would be scattered and persecuted for following him. And then he says this, <clears throat> I have told you these things so that in me you might find peace. In this world, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I've overcome this world. So, Jesus' last conversation with the disciples was focused on giving them peace. His first conversation with them after the resurrection is about giving them peace peace. Before Jesus' death, the disciples were just a, a group of pretty much ordinary men with much potential, but still just ordinary men. They didn't really have any power. They were fearful, and they were uncertain about what was to come. But Jesus wanted them to know that they did not need to be afraid and that they were not alone. From this day forward, Jesus would be defining, uh, be the defining mark of those who follow him. The peace that Jesus promises his followers is not based on our circumstances or any comfort or any confidence of our own ability. Jesus' peace comes from our knowledge of God's unfailing love and God's ultimate plan for this world. Peace comes from knowing the, the end of the story, really. That God plans to redeem all of creation and undo all the destruction and all the, the distance that, that's caused by sin. That sin that separates us from our loving God. That right there, my friends, is the peace that Jesus is offering to his disciples. He offered it to them then, and he offers it to us now. So what does that, that peace really look like in our lives? Well, I, I think, first of all, 
Jesus' peace leads us to understand more fully the real meaning of joy. Right after Jesus said, peace be with you, he did what I think is just the strangest thing. He showed them the scars in his hand and his side. And the disciples responded, and I think, just the strangest of ways. They were overjoyed. Why did he show his scars to the disciples? And why were they overjoyed at the sight of those scars? Well, I think it's because Jesus' scars proved God's love for them then and for us now. Jesus could have escaped his arrest and crucifixion. Jesus could have found a hundred different ways to save the world. But he chose, he chose instead to sacrifice himself, to bear the full penalty of suffering and death, and to save us from our sins. Those scars prove Jesus' commitment to his mission. And that is simply, since we are all sinners, he came and died for us. You'll find that in Romans 5, verse 8, by the way. He came and died for us, for you and for me. Jesus' scars show us the extent of God's love and the awesomeness of God's power. And when we know that kind of God as our loving creator, our loving father, perhaps, our sins are replaced, our fears are replaced, all with joy. Jesus' peace leads to joy. Jesus' peace also leads to courage. Immediately after showing them his scars, Jesus said, As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive someone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Whew. What an incredible calling. There is no way we can live the mission of Jesus with our own skills our own even charisma, perhaps. Jesus gives us something so much more. The power of the Holy Spirit that lives here within all of us. The Holy Spirit comforts us. The Holy Spirit strengthens us. It teaches us the truth of God and grows our character to be a little bit more like Jesus. The Holy Spirit in us assures us that we are never alone, even in the most difficult of times. That's a message we need to hear loudly and clearly right now. That same Holy Spirit reminds us that God will work all things together for good for those who love him who are called according to his purpose. One of my favorite verses from Romans 8, verse 28. The great uh, American civil rights leader, Martin Luther King Jr., was a person of tremendous courage. He endured persecution and beatings and imprisonment and death threats. His house was firebombed, and finally he was killed for standing up for what he believed in. So what kept him going? 
It was his strong sense of God's call in his life. Dr. King was just 26 years old when he was appointed leader of the civil rights movement in Montgomery, Alabama. One night he got a, a call from a man who said that his house, King's house, would be bombed in the next three days if he didn't get out of town. Fear filled Dr. King as he thought about the danger facing him and his family. If he continued to follow in God's calling, well, he wanted to turn and run away. He wanted to give up. He began praying to God and confessing his fears and his weaknesses. And he said, he sensed an inner voice saying, Martin Luther, stand up for what's right. Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for the truth. And lo, I will be with you even to the end of time. That prayer, that, that voice of assurance, allowed Dr. Martin Luther King to face his calling with courage. Three nights later, his house indeed was, was bombed and fire engulfed the front porch of his home. But he knew the call